Okay, Q&A time. So this has been a long time coming. I put this out on Instagram a while ago and you all came back with some great questions. So let's get to it. All right, first question, what motivates you and who inspired you to pick up the drums? So my dad is a drummer. So I've been playing since I was maybe five or six years old. There were always drums in the house. My dad was regularly gigging. And so after lots of nagging and uh, asking, I, he set me up with a small drum kit and that's where it began. And so I've been playing ever since. And he taught me from the beginning up until, well, up until well into my teens. But I also had some lessons at school around seven or eight um, through to early teens. Um, and then studied with a bunch of other people. But my dad is the reason I play the drums. As for what motivates me, that's a tough question. A lot of things, a lot of different things, um, and it changes. But when you've been doing something this long, it becomes part of your identity, and it would be weird to not do it. And so therefore, there's like a built-in discipline because it's so attached to who you are. And it's so it's therefore very important to you that you sound good and you play well and you perform well on, on gigs and uh, everything to do with your uh, work. So it's like built in that you wanna keep getting better and practicing and so that's what keeps you going. Okay, so I always get this question a lot. Who are some of your favorite drummers while you were coming up and who are some you look to for inspiration nowadays? So many, many, many drummers. Um, starting from Louis Belson, was one of my favorites when I was really young, seven or eight. My dad introduced me to Louis Belson and Buddy Rich, two of his favorite drummers. Then I remember seeing the Buddy Rich Memorial concert tapes, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, unbelievable uh, tapes with everybody. Dennis Chambers, Steve Gadd, Vinny, Dave Weckl, Greg Bissonette, Louis Belson. And so uh, I remember seeing Dennis play then and that was really just mind-blowing for me I mean it, still to this day he's in the, the top few drummers that just still now make me inspired to play and he still sounds amazing and his pocket is incredible and he's such a unique drummer so Dennis Chambers was a huge influence along with Dave Weckl those two guys during my teen years were really my favorite players and they although they share some of the same gigs and they play in a, in a similar uh, arena of styles. They're very different drummers and I thought that was kind of a looking back, you know, I have I think I have a little bit of both in terms of qualities from both. You know, Dennis has such an incredible pocket um, and Dave has such amazing finesse and he's such a beautiful uh, accompanist, such a tasteful player and Dennis had so much aggression and power. Um, so I think I've taken, I try to take elements from both of those guys. Who else? Uh, Steve Ferroni was a huge influence growing up. Um, I heard, first heard him through um, some uh, smaller artists he played with, a guitarist called Jeff Golub um, and David Garfield, piano player. And of course his work with Shaka Khan and Average White Band and Eric Clapton and everything else is one of my absolute favorites. Uh, Will Kennedy with the Yellow Jackets, another one. Um, Buddy Rich, of course, who I really got into heavily later on. So he was always around and watching his stuff, but I think later on I really appreciated his work, but not only as a soloist, because of, especially nowadays with YouTube, you, people type someone's name in and they just take the first thing or the first few things as that's what that person does. But the thing is with Buddy Rich, is not the soloing for me, it was his uh, everything else, his timekeeping, his interpretation, uh, he was a beautiful brush player, um, amazing accompanist, uh, just, in my opinion, just the greatest of all time. Steve Gadd was also a huge influence. I first saw him on those Buddy Rich tapes too, and then checked out all the hundreds of records that he's on across all the different styles that he is a master at. Um, who else? Um, Keith Carlock later on in my teen years. Um, Steve Smith. Um, Jeff Hamilton, Peter Erskine, uh, Horatio Hernandez I loved, still do of course, um, Virgil Donati and Thomas Lang. Um, I mean tons of people, I'm gonna f kick myself later on forgetting a bunch of names. If I do, I'll put them on the screen. But a real, a real mix of people and today, I mean it's also a huge list. Um, Marcus Gilmore is one of my absolute favorites these days. He's an incredible player. Um, check out the records he did with Chick Corea.
Okay, so the first gear question here. What's your favorite snare sound and how do you get it? So lots of questions on Instagram about drum tuning, but particularly snare drum tuning. So I generally, it completely depends on what I'm playing, the music I'm playing, what suits the song, what suits the band, the room. That's a, uh, something to consider also. I generally like higher pitch sounds and I like shorter drums. I like five inch, maybe five and a half inch drums. And I think that's something to do with playing traditional grip and the fact that the thinner drums are more snappy. Uh, you get more feedback because the bottom head is closer, of course. And so um, tuning wise, I have the bottom head very tight, almost tabletop tight. Not so much that it starts to choke the drum, but pretty tight. And I, and I leave it there for most of the time, depend, regardless of the tuning, I'll leave it nice and tight. And then I'll use the top head for pitch and for feel. So that's the head I'll change for pitch if I'm recording and I wanna go higher or lower, but generally like a kind of crisp, tight sound. Um, and I'm finding metal drums are my favorite these days. And I think that they're the drums that are most of the time easiest to get that high pitched crack. Um, wood drums tend to sound a little thicker and can be better at lower tunings or medium tunings. Uh, my favorite snare drum right now is the Pearl Dennis Chambers signature drum. It's a newish drum, it's aluminum, um, and it's 12 lugs on the top, eight on the bottom. And so it's so easy to get that high pitched crack without choking the drum because of the 12 lugs on top partly, um, the aluminum or aluminum shell. It just sounds fantastic, so check that drum out. So this is the question that everyone gets a lot about practicing. The usual question, how many hours a day minimum should someone practice to become a professional? So I heard a, uh, a friend of mine, Yannick Guzdala, amazing bass player, address this question on his um, social media. And he said how, because he gets this question and everybody has, does so much, he kind of had a different way of answering it and said, how about you practice all day? How about you practice as much as you possibly can and dial it back depending on the other things in life you need to do. So this depends very much on what your life is like, what age you are, what responsibilities you have. But rather than saying what's the minimum, you should be doing just every spare moment and practicing as much as physically possible and then dial it back from there. Another one on practice, how do you know what to practice? Again, a million things to talk about with this question, but one thing you could go straight to is recording yourself. And I talk about this so much with my students and also interesting talking about with fellow bandmates and people I work with and how few people do it. Um, partly because I've, I've met professional musicians that, that don't do it at all and they really should, should do it because they, they don't wanna hear what they sound like ultimately, and they don't want to ruin the memory of a good gig because you know if you don't record yourself a lot, what you think it sounds like and what it actually sounds like get further and further apart. So you might feel great and really enjoy the gig, um, and, but you don't want to hear it because you, you you're not used to doing that, and maybe you don't practice enough or whatever, and you don't want to hear how it actually sounds. But it's an extremely important thing to do, and um, that's a whole other topic. But what it does do immediately is give you a long list of stuff that you need to practice. So there are tons of things to practice. You can't do everything. You can't sit down and think, I gotta be perfect in every style. I gotta be able to sight read anything. I mean, there's only so many hours in the day and in my opinion, it's best to be really good at the things you love or the things you want to do rather than quite good at a ton of things. So yes, you could practice from five different books and do an hour of rudiments and an hour of hands and an hour of feet and, and find tons of things to practice. But what you really should be practicing, what should be at the top of the list are the things that you hear when you record yourself and you listen back and the things you're not happy with. How does the song feel? Uh, is it rushing? Is it dragging? Um, are you playing the right stylistic things? Ultimately, how do you sound in comparison to the people that you listen to and the, and the people that you love? Uh, and how you want to sound. So if, if you record yourself and you're not sounding like that, why not? And that's what you should be practicing, basically. Okay, another gear question, but not drums. This is about recording. What kind of equipment do you use to film and record your videos? So a lot of questions about this. My setup is pretty simple. I use iPhones for the most part. Um, I have some lights here in the studio. So that's the filming uh, aspect. And then I use Final Cut to edit. 
Uh, as far as audio is concerned, I'm using Earthworks mics, D DM20s on the toms and snare drum, um, SR25s as overheads, TC20s way up above me, omnidirectional mics as kind of room mics. Um, the kick mic is an SL25, I believe. Um, so that's the mic setup, and that goes into Logic to edit and mix, and I'm using Audient uh, preamps and an Apogee Symphony uh, interface and converter. Okay, last question. How is your playing so clean? What slash how do you practice in order to make everything you play so clean and pronounced? So this goes back to the recording yourself thing, I think, because I spent so many years recording myself and listening to my favorite drummers and constantly A-being and being unhappy with the results. And so you keep doing it and you narrowly close the gap. Um, so a lot of the drummers that I listened to were very good at that. So I get a lot of students asking about flow and about sound and playing clean, but they don't listen to the, the drummers that do that well. It's like trying to play Afro-Cuban music and listening to rock drummers. You're never gonna get that same thing because you've got to listen to, you've got to go to the source and what you think represents that and, and copy it at the beginning. Um, it's just a matter of, of um, A being. A lot of the drummers I listened to that I mentioned earlier, like Dennis Chambers, Steve Gadd, uh, Weckl, uh, Buddy Rich, I mean, they're incredibly clean players. Everything's very crisp uh, and beautifully played and executed. Um, so it's just practicing and recording yourself and A being, basically. As far as technically, um, it comes down to hand technique to a degree. Uh, I think that hand technique has a big impact on how you sound, um, more so than, than people think. So um, I practice a lot of hand technique stuff in terms of um, endurance exercises, um, practice a lot on towels and pillows, um, so that when I come to the drums, my capabilities are beyond what I would need because I practice on surfaces that have no rebound, so I've learned to pull out the sound. Um, and uh, just trained my wrists basically. So that helps with playing clean, playing fast without it sounding messy. Practicing rudiments really helps. People often talk about the difference between ghost notes and accents and how you get that big gap and, and big difference between them. So that when you start to play around the drums or even just on the snare drum and you're playing patterns that have accents and ghost notes, um, that you have that hills and valleys thing built in. So rudiments really help and particularly flam rudiments. Uh, because the flam has that built in. You have, you have one stick low, one stick high, so you learn about stick heights, and, and one stick is, is a tiny bit off the drum for that quiet note, and the other one is playing a, a full stroke for the accent. So if you practice a lot of flam rudiments, that, all of that stuff is kind of built in, uh, and you get your hands going with that kind of thing. All right, thanks for watching. Thanks for the great questions. We'll do another one of these very soon. Uh, check out my Instagram page. I'll put the link in the description below, and I'll see you on the next one.